So we want to welcome everybody that is uh, live with us today. Uh, it's noon, so we'll start slowly. We know that uh, a lot of you are listening live. A lot of you, maybe most of you will listen to the recording because we, most of us were able to go back to our daily routine and daily activity, daily patience. So we are not able to attend at all at the same time, but we really appreciate your interest. As we mentioned uh, at the end of the last webinar, last week webinars, uh, this week is a little bit special because all the other webinars were really into the literature, biomechanic and knee function. But you, you see that we use a lot of time uh, knee KG results, which is a device that we use for our patient. And we have a lot of questions about, well, what is this device that you're using? For the, so, so the goal of today's session is really to talk about this device, how we came to be comfortable with it, where it come from, how it is supported by literature. And for that, we have uh, Joseph Zeni that will walk us through that um, more detailed presentation about the Nikichi itself. But next, we'll, we'll, next week, we will go back to knee function and go back to what is the normal or healthy function of the knee and uh, the week after how it impacts our exercise treatment plan. So Joseph, please uh, uh, walk us through this great presentation. Sounds good, thank you, Phil. So as, again, as Phil mentioned, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the uh, practical aspects of you know, using the knee KG in a clinical setting. So less about the overall clinical application of, or the, the less about overall clinical context of the conditions and more about if you're gonna use the knee KG in the clinic, you know, these are the things that you should be aware of when trying to implement this technology. And you know, just some background, um, you know, this is a technology that was really born out of uh, the academic world. So even though now it's in the commercial space and you know, it's, it's um, uh, a technology that can be kind of bought and used by clinicians, um, it really was developed in an academic setting. So really like a research type device that has now made its way into the commercial world. So, um, you know, in thinking about you know, biases and things like that, you know, this was really developed to be a true objective measure of um, knee kinematics. So again, we'll walk through today. Uh, thanks, Phil, for the intro. And, and today we're really going to focus on kind of the why, what, and when. So, so more of the, the hands-on stuff. And at the end, we'll kind of wrap up with the business model. So you know, questions that everybody always has is, if I am going to use this device, or if I'm interested in using this device, you know, how is the business model work? How will I be able to um, uh, attract patients in, and how will you know patients be billed, and how will um, I be charged for using this type of device? So as we've done in the past, um, you know, we always like to start with that visual assessment challenge and kind of a case-based approach to understanding why this technology is so relevant and why it is so important. So you know, the case we're going to go through today is the case of Mary, who's 37 years old. She had a previous ACL reconstruction on the left knee. And while everything's been kind of resolved from the surgical standpoint, uh, she still continues to have pain in the medial aspect, as well as in the patellofemoral aspects of the knee joint. So she received the, the typical plan of care that you would expect from somebody who had ACL reconstruction with some residual pain. She has a stabilization brace that she uses. She has pain management, including pain medicine. And then from the physio perspective, she's done glute strengthening, quadriceps hamstring strengthening, proprioceptive exercises, as well as some functional retraining exercises, including squatting and jumping to try and get back to higher levels of function with more uh, normal movement patterns. But even despite all this, this care, she still has continued pain in the knee after surgery. So the question we ask ourselves is, Somebody who's coming in with knee pain, you know, whether it is um, a post-operative patient or whether this is a patient that is, uh, has no surgical history, if I know something about the dynamic alignment of the knee or what the knee is doing in terms of movement and kinematics, will that inform my treatment plan so I can change the way I'm intervening and actually address the underlying root causes of this residual knee pain. 
So in our previous webinars, we've talked a lot about you know, biomechanical markers for different conditions, and we're not going to go through all of them again today, but just keeping in kind of the back of our head that there are numerous biomechanical abnormalities that we know contribute to knee pain. And some of these might be more specific to OA, some might be specific to patellofemoral pain, um, but in general, not everybody's going to have the same biomechanical markers that lead to the same type of knee pain. So we need to be wary and we need to be able to try and identify from the, this multitude of potential biomechanical abnormalities, which are the most important or most relevant in our patients. And of course, the challenge with this is if we think about, okay, I want to be looking for 10 or 15 different biomechanical abnormalities, I'm trying to do that with my, my eyes during a gait cycle that lasts less than one second. Even if I slow down the video that I'm taking of my patient and try and look and see what's going on, you know that we end up with a lot of visual illusion. So changes in the hip positioning or the foot positioning can change what we're actually seeing at the knee joint. So somebody who might appear to have a rotational problem at the knee well, maybe that's not a rotational problem at the knee. Maybe it's actually a flexion problem at the knee because the hip is externally rotated. So we know that from a visual perspective, even with the technology of slowing down video, we're really not able to capture or identify these biomechanical abnormalities that occur at the knee. We do have the opportunity to look at things like x-rays and MRIs, but again, those are static. They don't tell us anything about dynamic alignment. They tell us exactly what's happening with the knee, typically in an unloaded or non-weight-bearing position, and certainly not during a functional activity. And then the, the last you know, way that we can look at movement is, is a gait analysis system, you know, a big uh, traditional gait lab, but these are very technologically heavy, they're very expensive, and they're typically only used for clinical research or in some cases for surgical planning. But we don't really have anything to date that's really allowed us to identify what are the mechanics going on at the knee joint when somebody is walking. And so again, as always, we'll present our uh, visual assessment challenge. So this is our patient here. This is Mary walking after her ACL reconstruction. And again, I'm going to encourage you to watch these videos and see if you can identify any biomechanical abnormalities in the way that she's moving. And think about if I can identify any biomechanical abnormalities, how is that going to affect my treatment plan for Mary? So Phil's put a poll up. So again, in this poll, just try and keep an eye on anything you can identify that might be abnormal for this patient. So we're looking at her left knee. Uh, so the one on the right side of the screen from the, the frontal uh, plane and the one closest to the screen in the side view. So we'll give everybody a minute to get their, their answers in. Again, if you've attended our previous webinars, we've gone into a little bit more detail about what these biomechanical deficiencies are. Um, so now trying to you know, identify them in this patient. Do you see anything in the sagittal plane or anything in the frontal plane or any rotations that are occurring uh, at the lower leg, again, that may be contributing to residual knee pain after surgery? Give everyone another second or two, get your answers in. It's already very interesting uh, if we compare with the results that I'm seeing now that uh, we've seen uh, on, on Tuesday, right? On the last session, uh, already the results differ. So it's really interesting when you take a large group of uh, trained uh, rehab or clinician, right? How it's difficult to come to a consensus every time. So I'm going to uh, end the polling right now. And share the results. So what do we have? Well, in terms of frontal alignment, there's no absolutely no consensus, right? We see that 
uh, we have some for, for virus, some for vulgus, some for thrust, but uh, really a minority of votes in any way. So absolutely no uh, majority consensus here. The, the highest, we could say the highest one that was identified was the lateral or, or external tubal rotation that reached 42% uh, of the voters. So we kind of see everything and nothing for her. Uh, and this is what makes it challenging to make sure it did we really restored the function of that patient. So maybe we, if we don't see anything major as a consensus, maybe we think, well, she does not have anything, anything major. Maybe we think that she has a good function, in fact, and the job was well done and she would be good to go to resume, for example, tennis. So maybe we can ask ourselves if we think everything is normal, what's the benefit of having an EKG, for example? And that's what we're going to show with the results right now. Excellent. Thanks for voting, everybody. So again, some of you may be uh, slightly familiar with an EKG, but I just want to you know, highlight some of the aspects of what this um, product actually is. And so when you look at the, the product, and we'll go into more detail about this a little bit later, uh, but it really consists of an exoskeleton device that goes around the femur, and then some straps that go around the tibia as well. They contain reflective markers that you can see here that are picked up by a surgical grade infrared camera. And then that information about the marker position is relayed back to a computer that uses kind of algorithms as well as an AI to identify what the joint position is uh, of the knee in all three uh, dimensions or all three uh, cardinal planes of movement. What's nice about this device, it's not only the system itself, so here's the exoskeleton, but it's integrated into a whole entire assessment and reporting system. So here you can see a patient walking with the device. You can get real-time uh, video or feedback about what the three-dimensional motions of the knee are. It's integrated with an immediate reporting system, so it'll tell you what the biomechanical deficits are that can then be uh, integrated into a rehab program and selected exercises can be identified specific to the biomechanical abnormalities that were identified with an EKG. So it's really this, this uh, assessment device, analysis device, and reporting uh, device kind of all uh, in one system here. And when we think about how do we use the information from that EKG, well, one of the things that we get from it is we get this immediate uh, result, this immediate report about the patient's movement profile. So this is something that can be used for the, the physiotherapist to say, okay, here are the things that we identified as being abnormal in the way that you move. What it also can do is create a report that can be presented to a surgeon or the treating physician to say, here are the... Um, biomechanical deficiencies that we noted when the patient was in being assessed in our office. And then kind of the, the one of the best things about this device is that you can also uh, develop or it also provide suggested therapies and visual aids for the patient. So it's going to prompt you as to, as to what are the therapies or what are the interventions that can address these biomechanical abnormalities and also provide some visual and text uh, information that's going to help the patient understand what their movement abnormalities are. So it's really a system that can help both the, the physiotherapist, it can help the physician or the surgeon, as well as help the patient understand what's going on uh, with uh, their pain or with their movement abnormalities. So if we go back to, to Mary, um, you know, there were some things that were identified as being abnormal in the way that she was moving. In particular, she had a varus thrust during the loading response. And if you can recall back, or if you were part of the, the previous webinars, we talked about how varus thrust is a very high predictive biomechanical marker of osteoarthritis progression in the future. So this is something right off the bat that I'm thinking, okay, here is a patient who is active, who is relatively young, who wants to get back to doing higher level activities. I need to make sure that I'm addressing this varus thrust so I don't set her up for having worsening of the knee pain and worsening of osteoarthritis in the future. So right off the bat, there's one thing that we can identify that we're gonna to wanna to work on. The other thing that we see that might be more specific to her current pain presentation is that she presents with internal rotation of the tibia 
uh, when she is loading. So this is kind of what we think of as this collapse of the lower leg. She's not able to support and keep the lower leg in a neutral position, but rather it collapses during the loading response of the, the gait cycle. What this is gonna do, it's gonna change where the, the forces are being distributed through the tibial femoral joint, and it's also gonna bring the patella medially. So this might make sense with some of the tibial femoral uh, medial compartment pain she had, as well as the patella femoral pain she has. So these are gonna be things that I want to address in terms of the new treatment paradigm. So we went from kind of a one size fits all standard of care based on the musculoskeletal deficits. So glute strengthening, quadriceps strengthening, hamstring strengthening, uh, and really go into providing her with exercises that are going to improve her varus thrust or reduce her varus thrust and really prevent that internal tibial rotation or the collapse that we see during the loading response phase. So we're not going to go into uh, the, what those specific exercises are. In the subsequent webinar next week, we will actually be talking more about exercise prescription for these patients. But these are the things that I'm going to want to address with Mary to make sure, one, that I set her up for success in the future, long-term outcomes, and two, that I address the biomechanical markers that may be causing the patellofemoral and tibiofemoral pain that she's experiencing right now. So that was done in this case, and uh, we were able to integrate those biomechanical exercises into her plan of care. She was able to get back to all of her daily activities, including tennis, and didn't have any pain in the medial and patellofemoral joints of the, of the knee. Again, cases are great. But we want to know, are these results replicable? And I won't go into too much detail about the study because I know for some of you, we have covered this before. Uh, but, you know, there was an independent study uh, that was done by several of the large research hospitals in, in Canada. And they included almost 900 patients that were divided up into one of three groups. All of these patients had knee osteoarthritis and were seeking care at their primary care physician for that knee pain. And so they're divided into three groups. The first group had an EKG, but everybody was blinded to what the outcomes of the EKG were. So they underwent the EKG, but none of that information was used in their plan of care. So that's the usual care group. They did whatever they would do for a patient who would come in off the street with knee pain uh, without having any understanding of what their biomechanics are. The second group of patients underwent an EKG, but the primary care physician wasn't blinded to the results. So they actually used the results from the EKG to prescribe whatever intervention would be most appropriate for that patient. So that might've been bracing, that might've been physiotherapy or specific exercises um, to help improve the movement profile, uh, might've been pain meds or injections, but they used that information from the EKG to help guide the treatment plan. The third group was the same as the second group. So they had an EKG, those results were used in their plan of care, but they also had some follow-up educational uh, sessions with a physiotherapist down the line to help make sure they were progressing their biomechanical uh, specific exercises and answer any questions that they may have regarding their um, knee movement or their knee pain. And then in terms of results, you know, what we saw was the groups that integrated knee KG into their assessment had much greater outcomes across the board when we look at symptoms or pain or quality of life or ability to participate in activities of daily living, um, as well as satisfaction, both from the patient perspective as well as from the physician perspective. So, you know, we really saw from this study is that understanding the biomechanical abnormalities on a patient specific level or on an individual level and providing treatment that wasn't a one size fits all type of intervention really improved outcomes uh, for these patients. You know, we tend to think patients with, a, with knee OA are on this trajectory towards knee replacement and that there's, you know, going to be a um, decrease in function over time. And, you know, I think the results that we saw here really challenged that conventional thinking that, no, not everybody with knee OA is going to get dramatically worse and need a knee replacement uh, within a couple of months. You know, we can actually change uh, the way that these, these patients are uh, moving, and then also change the way that they experience their outcomes. One of the things that I think is most interesting from this study is, you know, not only were uh, self-reported outcomes changed, and not only was pain improved, and not only were patients satisfied when using the EKG, but we actually saw a change in the way people moved when they were giving feedback 
and when they were giving exercises to address those biomechanical abnormalities. So you can see that group that underwent the knee KG and then also had some of the additional physiotherapy sessions afterwards actually had a 2.2 degree change in their varus thrust, a decrease in their varus thrust. And so as we mentioned before, varus thrust is one of the strongest predictors of osteoarthritis worsening uh, in the future. And so we also think that biomechanics are really not so changeable, particularly in the frontal plane without you know, giving the patient a brace. But here we have evidence that even without walking with a brace, and even without big muscular stabilizers on the medial and lateral side of the knee, I can actually change somebody's movement profile on the frontal plane. So these people actually had a reduced risk of OA progression because their varus thrust was decreased. In terms of the, the history of uh, this device, uh, you know, there have been many studies that have looked at the validity of this knee KG as it pertains to the accuracy of uh, actually measuring uh, the movement that the knee is experiencing. And so there were studies that were done uh, that actually compare the knee KG results to fluoroscopic results. So the fluoroscopic results are going to give us an understanding of what the actual bone positions are relative to one another. So kind of one of the best ways to actually identify what the knee joint angles are. And you can see in terms of varus valgus, or I had an abduction, so movement in the frontal plane, the accuracy was within 0.4 degrees. So that is an exceptionally small um, potential difference between those two different devices. They're essentially measuring the exact same thing. And this is really important because a lot of the patients with knee pathology have abnormalities in the frontal plane that we're trying to address. So this tells us that the knee KG is really accurate at being able to identify any changes, true changes within the frontal plane. Rotations have notoriously been the most problematic um, uh, plane to measure when it comes to motion analysis systems. Uh, there's so much uh, skin movement artifact that can affect these. There's so much other sort of um, uh, proximal and distal contributions that can affect the way that the axial rotation is measured, so internal, external rotation. And even with all these problems that uh, are associated with axial rotation measurement, you can see that we're still only 2.3 degrees uh, difference from what the fluoroscopy showed. So again, a really small amount of difference between what can be measured with fluoroscopy and what can be measured with an EKG. When you look at translation, so we are, you know, we're always concerned about anterior and posterior translation of the tibia underneath the femur, particularly with patients that are ACL deficient or who've had an ACL reconstruction. And even with this AP translation, you know, the level of accuracy is within 2.4 millimeters. That's an exceptionally small um, level of accuracy. So it's really precise and accurate measurements that we're getting from the knee KG as compared to fluoroscopic measurements of those same movements. So since the you know, development of this device, again, it came from an academic environment, you know, it has been the subject of over 100 peer-reviewed publications. And you know, if you go to PubMed and you search knee KG, you don't find a whole lot of articles that are going to get returned uh, because, again, a lot of these articles were done before commercialization. So it wasn't called the knee KG. You know, it was um, the knee assessment device, but it wasn't commercialized. So if you look at uh, what's out there. There's a, a wealth of information pertaining to the validity and the accuracy and the effectiveness of this type of device, but relatively few of them are going to call it by the commercial name of knee KG. But we do have the information available to you, should you want it, about all of the articles that have been published related to, to this product. This is also a device that's FDA cleared in the U.S. It's Health Canada cleared in Canada, and it's also CE marked for uh, the European Union. So the takeaway from you know, the knee KG assessment is we want to get away from one-size-fits-all interventions, which is fairly commonplace in the way that we approach you know, patients in our clinical setting. Here comes a patient who had an ACL reconstruction. Well, here's my protocol that I'm going to do with them. Here's a patient with knee OA. Well, here's my knee OA protocol that I'm going to do with them. Really going from the model of one-size-fits-all based on what the pathology is and going to personalize interventions based on what their movement profile is. And that's a big kind of leap from the way that we typically approach uh, knee joint disorders. 
So what we'll do in the next handful of slides is kind of answer the question of for whom. So one of the things we want to know is who should be getting the knee kg? Is it something that I should just apply across the board to any patient that walks through the doors? Or is there a subset of patients that are going to receive the most benefit from receiving the knee kg assessment? And so we'll really talk about who are the patients that will receive the best benefit or the most benefit from undergoing a knee kg. We'll start in the context of anterior knee pain, or really kind of patellofemoral pain syndrome. And we'll present two cases. The first is Jessica. She's a 26-year-old woman with persistent anterior knee pain. She has pain during stairs and lunges and squats, the typical sorts of uh, problematic activities you expect out of somebody that has patellofemoral pain syndrome. She's gone to a sports med uh, physician who diagnosed her with uh, patellofemoral pain syndrome. And to date, she's done a lot of PT. She's already done a lot of rehab that include glutes and quadriceps strengthening, really working on improving um, you know, her, mus her muscles that surround the knee joint to provide the stability there. Despite this, she still has not had success. She still has residual knee pain. Our other patient is a 29-year-old runner and soccer player who has patellar tendon tendonitis. Uh, and that developed recently after doing an ultra trail competition. So the knee is still really tender and the tendon is swollen or the knee is still swollen and there's still a good amount of inflammation and tenderness in and around the, the knee joint in that region. So I know this kind of you know, may look complicated at first glance, but this is uh, a framework or a decision tree that you can use to help identify the patients that are gonna get the most benefit from undergoing an EKG. So if we start thinking about, okay, Here's a patient coming through my door that has anterior knee pain and that knee pain increases with movement and activity. What am I going to do for those patients? Well, one of the first things we have to ask ourselves is, is this patient in the inflammatory phase? So if somebody is in the inflammatory phase, I know that effusion and inflammation around the knee joint are going to change the way that I move. So somebody who has uh, this inflammatory phase, it's not chronic inflammation, but it's really this, this um, initial phase, this inflammatory phase, I know that their movement profile is going to be altered. So I'm not so sure that the information I'm going to obtain from the knee KG of somebody in the inflammatory phase is really going to reflect what their actual movement patterns are. So if somebody's in the inflammatory phase, so shown here in red, this is somebody who's probably not the ideal candidate to undergo an EKG. If somebody is not in the inflammatory phase, I'm gonna follow this decision tree down and ask the next, next question of, is kinesiopathology suspected? So what I mean by that is, do I suspect that this patient could have some movement impairment that's an underlying cause of their pain? Pretty much anybody that has patellofemoral pain, I'm gonna to consider to have a potential kinesiopathology it's likely that the way that they're moving is contributing to this knee pain. If that's not the case, well, then I'm gonna move down here and probably not do uh, the knee KG at this time point. But somebody, again, who does have kinesiopathology suspected, well, I'm gonna give them the, the knee KG. This is all in the context of the initial treatment examination. So again, I'm thinking about this as, as the person comes into my door and I'm doing my initial evaluation, who am I gonna give that knee KG to? And so again, it's gonna be the person who's not in the inflammatory phase. And there, I suspect that there potentially is some relation between their movement patterns and the impairments that they're experiencing. We can also think kind of longer term. So now let's think about um, the fact that this patient may have had pathology that's changing the way they move. So kind of the opposite of what we talked about before where it's now the pathology changing the way that somebody moves. If that is the, the thought process, then again, yes, I want to give them an EKG because I want to identify what are the abnormalities in their movement based on whatever the structural pathology is that's going on. So and this would be somebody who would be a candidate for undergoing an EKG as well. If we think about our, our patient cases, this is where Jessica is. So Jessica is the uh, patient with patellofemoral pain. She's out of the inflammatory phase. You know, this is really a chronic condition that she's not uh, had relief with to, to this point. Um, so she is somebody who would undergo knee KG to see if I can identify biomechanical abnormalities that are causing the knee pain to occur. 
somebody like Andrews down here in the inflammatory phase, right? A recent onset of these symptoms. He still has a fusion. He still has inflammation. He still has a lot of tenderness. So I would wait until he's out of the inflammatory phase before I undergo a knee KG. During this phase, I would work on modalities and interventions that really reduce the inflammation before I try and identify what's his real underlying uh, movement pattern. So now let's talk about ACL tear. And again, we'll present two cases of Jessica and Andrew. Jessica is a 40-year-old female who tore her ACL four weeks ago. She still has edema. She has a positive pivot shift and Lachman test and has feelings of joint instability. So, you know, a fairly common presentation of somebody who's within a month of tearing their ACL. Andrew, on the other hand, is a retired soccer player. He had ACL surgery 15 years ago, but he's still now presenting with uh, OA and medial compartment knee pain. He has a lot of joint stiffness. He has great strength, uh, but he does have kind of stiffness and pain in and around the medial compartment of the knee. So again, thinking about that, that patient walking through your door, history of ACL reconstruction, or uh, I'm sorry, history of ACL tear, we have to think about first, are they in the inflammatory phase? If they are in the inflammatory phase, again, I'm not gonna go and provide the knee KG at this time point because it's not gonna give me accurate information of what their true movement pattern is. It's gonna reflect the effusion edema uh, movement patterns, but not really what their true movement patterns are. If they're not in the inflammatory phase, well, with an ACL tear, there's several different options that we can think of in terms of what the patients might be doing next. If the patient is undergoing surgery, you know, immediately undergoing surgery, then maybe this person does not need an EKG. It might be good to have as baseline information, but if they're going right into surgery, it's not really going to do a whole lot uh, in terms of my immediate treatment plan with this patient. If the patient is not in uh, need of surgery, but they do have that ACL tear, well then yeah, I'm gonna give them an EKG because it's gonna allow me to go and tailor my rehab to the specific biomechanical abnormalities that they're experiencing. Where we also see a really important fit for the knee KG and use for the knee KG is if that patient is unsure about whether surgery is needed. In this case, the knee KG can provide some objective information as to how severe those movement abnormalities are. If there is a whole lot of collapse during loading or excessive movement in the frontal plane or the sagittal plane uh, that shouldn't be there, well, that might be indicative of somebody who needs surgery to correct the structure. If somebody looks really stable and doesn't have really an abnormal movement profile during walking, then maybe that's somebody who will not end up needing surgery. So in this case, the knee KG can play a role in actually identifying or help to triage those who might need surgery versus those who have a normal movement pro profile and may not get any additional benefit from undergoing surgery. So in terms of where do our patients fit here? Well, Jessica is still in that really acute phase. So four weeks after the initial injury, even though she has instability, uh, she does still have a lot of edema, which is probably uh, changing the way that she moves. So not the ideal candidate to undergo the knee KG at this time point. And now let's talk about our, our other kind of uh, end of the spectrum. How about somebody who has already undergone surgery for ACL reconstruction? You know, is this the person that I would put into the knee KG to understand what's going on from a mechanical perspective? Well, we have to ask ourselves, is revision surgery required for this patient walking through the door? Or do they plan on undergoing the revision surgery? If the answer is yes, again, I'm probably not gonna get a whole lot of additional information from the knee KG. They're gonna undergo surgery and that's gonna change the way they move. So maybe I don't need uh, the knee KG at this time point. However, let's consider three different type of options of patients that we typically see in the clinic after an ACL reconstruction. The first would be the patient three months after surgery. So at this point, I know that the surgery itself is gonna have an effect on the way that I'm moving. And so, if I undergo a knee KG, I can identify, you know, what are the residual effects of the surgery and the injury, and I can develop a treatment plan to address those residual deficits so I don't end up with having chronic knee pain or chronic movement deficiencies. We also might see this patient later in the course of their care. So all of the musculoskeletal impairments have really been resolved, but now they want to go back to returning to sports. So really a higher level of function um, uh, is what they're asking to do now. This is a patient who, again, I put on the knee KG and see if I can identify 
any movement abnormalities that are going to impair the way that they perform their sporting activities or potentially put them at risk of having a re-injury once they go back to participating in sports. So again, I can use the EKG at this time point as kind of a risk screening tool to see whether or not there's any movement abnormalities that are gonna be affecting uh, the way that this person returns to their sports. And then finally, I can have my patient who would be my Andrew in this case. This is somebody who is several years post-op. Um, they have some functional deficits. They have some residual pain. But what my real concern now is one, addressing their residual pain, which may have a movement component associated with it, but also trying to reduce the risk of OA progression. So I want to identify biomechanical markers that are contributing to their current pain, but also see if they have any abnormal biomechanics that may contribute to OA worsening in the future. So things like varus thrust or tibial rotation. Those are things that I also want to address in a patient like Andrew. So I would put them uh, through the knee KG as well. And then we have knee osteoarthritis. Again, even though this is a singular diagnosis, people look very different in terms of what they look like when they have knee OA. So here we have Jessica, who's a 60-year-old woman with moderate to severe knee OA, and she really has difficulty with her daily activities and walking. So somebody on that kind of end of the spectrum where the OA is interfering with their ability to walk and move and participate in their daily activities. On the other end, we have Andrew, who's a 63-year-old male, who has uh, is still hiking, still participating in higher level sports activities. He has pain in the anterior medial aspect of the knee, and the symptoms really developed during his sports and now are starting to bleed into his daily activities. And they've kind of progressed to the point where he's kind of starting to cease some of those higher level physical activities. So let's look at these, um, you know, these cases here. In the one hand, we can have a patient who comes in with a known medical history where they have an injury uh, profile of a previous ACL. You know, maybe they have a PCL tear, meniscal tear. Maybe they have a history of a fracture in and around the knee joint. This is a patient that I'm going to put on the EKG to identify what their biomechanical risk factors are for that um, previous injuries causing worsening of their OA. The other thing I might do is put... Uh, a patient who is really active, who has knee OA onto the knee KG. Again, somebody who's really active with knee OA, if they're telling me they want to return back to these higher level activities, I have to make sure that they have a normal movement profile before I say, yeah, you can go back to playing tennis or go back to hiking. I want to make sure that there's nothing grossly abnormal uh, and I can develop a rehab program that really identifies those um, biomechanical risk factors that they may have. So that's kind of for the one end of the spectrum where the person's at risk for OA or uh, maybe has mild OA. I really want to identify what the risk factors are to develop a treatment plan that not only addresses their pain, but again, reduces the risks of that OA getting worse. On the other end of the spectrum, you know, we have patients that have more severe OA. And so the first thing we're going to ask is, as that patient comes to the door, is this a patient who is already set up and is going to undergo surgery in the near future? Well, if not, I say, okay, they're not undergoing surgery. Are they currently in an inflammatory phase? And in a way, it's not so much an inflammatory phase. A lot of these patients have chronic underlying joint effusion, but are they in the middle of a big flare-up of their symptoms? And sometimes with patients with a knee away, as you know, you know, their symptoms go up and down. I don't want to do the knee KG in the middle of their flare-up because, again, it's not going to capture what they're true movement profile is. It's going to capture what their movement profile is during this flare-up, but not their actual underlying movement patterns. So I say, okay, not during the inflammatory phase. Let's move on to the next part of our decision tree. Is this a deconditioned patient? Sometimes you get patients with knee OA who have severe knee OA, you know, who are not able to walk for a couple of minutes at a time without really getting winded or really getting uh, deconditioned. So if the patient is able to walk for a few minutes at a time, then again, an EKG would be appropriate for this patient to identify the underlying biomechanical abnormalities. Now let's take on the other side, somebody who is planning to have surgery. Well, if the patient is uh, planning on having surgery, but there's still some time left before the surgery, we know that prehab can be beneficial for, for patients who are undergoing knee replacement. So I'd want to put a patient who would be participating in prehab on the knee KG see what their specific abnormalities are, and address those as part of the treatment plan. If somebody is having surgery uh, or is planning to have surgery, um, but isn't planning to undergo uh, 
um, a prehab, maybe this isn't the ideal person for the NIKG, but the NIKG can be used again to triage patients uh, who may be on a waiting list. So I can identify patients who have really severe movement abnormalities versus somebody who has severe OA from a radiographic perspective, but still moves fairly normally. So the knee KG can be useful in discriminating between you know, patients with knees that look the same on x-ray, but one that has a really poor movement profile and one that has a more normal movement profile. And this might affect kind of things like the timing or decision to undergo that surgery. So if we look at our, our one patient, Jessica, who's kind of like at the end stage planning for surgery, you know, this is where she would fall in. Um, I'd want to, you know, do prehab before surgery to identify the biomechanical and musculoskeletal impairments. So I would do an EKG with her. Um, if we look at Andrew, again, this is our, our more active patient. And again, I want to set him up for addressing the pain he currently has, but also identify risk factors that may make that OA get worse in the future. So again, I would do an EKG with him as well. Our final category here that we'll talk about is the patient after knee replacement. So who after knee replacement might benefit from undergoing a knee, uh, knee KG? Well, again, we'll talk about two cases. Jessica, 75 years old. She had her right knee done eight years ago. She's scheduled now to have her left knee done. She has a substantial pain in that left knee during walking. On the other hand, we have Andrew, who had right knee pain that appeared 12 months after his knee replacement. You know, the treating surgeon confirmed that there were no issues with the prosthetic device. Everything looked good. Uh, and he recommended that he have some exercises and brace to uh, address that residual pain. Despite this, you know, this is the patient who has that, that mystery knee, as we refer to. Uh, everything looks good, but despite interventions and despite everything looking good, they continue to have pain uh, on the operated knee after surgery. So again, let's think about our post-TKA patients. Again, if somebody is in that prehab phase uh, we talked about before, uh, they would undergo an EKG. But in the patients that come in afterwards, we have to consider a couple of things in terms of are they going to benefit from the EKG. So let's say the patient comes in three to six weeks, they've done their standard rehab protocol after their knee replacement. And you have to first have to ask, okay, do they have uh, pain in their knee without any structural or articular causes? So some kind of unknown pain in the knee. If the answer is yes, well, then that's somebody who I would pretty much immediately refer to an EKG. This patient had a knee replacement. Everything looks good structurally, but they're still having pain. What's going on? Is their biomechanics contributing to that residual pain? If they don't have pain, you know, then we have to ask the next question of, okay, you don't have pain, but are you an active or motivated patient? Do you want to get back to higher level activities than simply you know, rising out of your couch and walking to the, the grocery store? If the answer is yes, again, this is somebody who's going to be a candidate for an EKG because I want to make sure that any underlying movement abnormalities are resolved before I start uh, allowing them to go back to higher level activities or before I develop a treatment plan to get them back to higher level activities. If the patient is not the motivated patient or really active patient, again, I go to the next part of my decision tree and that is, are they scheduled for a contralateral TK? If the answer is yes, well then probably not going to give this patient an EKG because they're under going to go surgery within a couple of weeks and they're going to change the way that they move after surgery. On the other hand, if the patient is not scheduled for contralateral TK, I know that the way a patient moves is going to put them at risk for uh, having OA progression on their non-operated side. So again, I would do an EKG to identify any movement abnormalities that might set them up for a poor outcome on their contralateral knee in the future. So where did Jessica fall into this? Well, she was scheduled for the contra TK. Maybe she's not the best candidate for um, a knee replacement. Andrew, on the other hand, you know, he's had um, the, this residual pain, this mystery knee. So he would fall into someone that I would actually prescribe the knee KG to identify any underlying pathology that might be contrib or movement abnormalities that might contribute to his uh, knee pain that he currently experiences. So in the next minute or two, I just want to talk very briefly about, you know, how does the, the knee KG actually work? Like um, when it's in the clinic, on the ground, what are you actually doing with your patient uh, to be able to get the useful information out of it? And so if you look in general, the patient's going to, you know, come in through the door. You've identified them as being a candidate for the knee KG. 
the first thing you're going to do is you're going to install the exoskeleton. And this is a really simple setup where you identify the size of their thigh and the size of their tibia or their lower leg. And you put on this exoskeleton that takes just two or three minutes to put on um, and attach to both the femur as well as attach to the tibia. The next thing that you have to do is the camera is going to uh, need to know where those markers are in space. So you do a little bit of a calibration that's going to identify both anatomical landmarks on the lower leg as well as where the joint centers at both the knee and the hip. So it's a, a very brief calibration period. Then the patient's going to walk on the treadmill for two bouts of 45 seconds. So it's really only about a minute and a half of walking that your patient has to do. The camera is going to record the, the knee joint kinematics. It's going to be analyzed and processed. And then an immediate report is going to be generated. The report that's going to be generated will give you the curves, so what the knee motion is looking like over time, as well as numbers relating to the magnitude, so how much varus did they have, how much knee flexion excursion that they have. And these are generated immediately, or within a couple of seconds, of completing those walking trials. <clears throat> so it's really about you know, 20 to 30 minutes uh, uh, time from both, including both the installation, calibration, walking, and then the report generation. So it's really a quick, um, uh, kind of a quick setup and a quick analysis here. So again, if you look at the calibration, the calibration is very simple and straightforward. You use this little wand to identify where the anatomical markers are. So where's the medial and lateral malleolus? Where's the medial and lateral femoral condyle? Where are these easily identifiable um, anatomical landmarks? Then you do the Oops, excuse me. Then you do the calibration for both the knee and the hip by using simple movements of swinging the leg around into circumduction to identify the hip joint center and bending the knee uh, slightly to identify the knee joint center. And then once the axes are defined, again, then I can have the patient walk on the treadmill and actually can do the test. And what's great about this test is it only takes two, a minute and a half to do the actual testing. So it's two 45 second walking bouts on a treadmill. You get real time biofeedback on the screen, as you can see here. There's real time projection of what the joint angles are. And then immediately afterwards, you're going to get that report that's going to be generated. So within a couple of minutes, I can go from assessing my patient, analyzing my patient, and really developing a treatment plan for what am I going to do based on the movement abnormalities that have been identified in the report. And what's been really nice is that the intervention piece has been integrated into platforms such as Physiotech. So now you can go to the Movi therapy module in Physiotech, and based on what the movement abnormalities are, you can uh, bring up templates that will give you actual exercise suggestions based on what the movement abnormalities uh, that were identified during the knee KG. So you really have this streamlined system of going from assessment, analysis, to what are the most appropriate treatment interventions to address those underlying biomechanical abnormalities that I just evaluated. So this is something that can easily be integrated into an initial evaluation for your patient um, when they come through your, your clinic doors. And so that's kind of the, the clinical perspective of um, the NIKG. What I want to do now is turn the floor over to Mike, uh, who's going to talk about what is the business model of the NIKG? You know, what's the, the the nuts and bolts of how do I get one of these into my clinic and how do I uh, get reimbursed and how do I get charged for using this type of uh, product. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, so basically, uh, my name is Michael Gazelle. I'm a Vice President of Business Development at Movi. And at Movi, essentially our objective is to create a community of users worldwide. And our business model is, is a collaborative business model in that, as you will see, uh, there are no upfront costs for the equipment, uh, nor the training, as, as you'll see. Uh, we, we work based on a pay-per-use model, which is $75 uh, US uh, per assessment. And so the clinic will charge, uh, and it varies depending on the re region of the world uh, where the unit is, um, anywhere between two, uh, 185 US and 225 US for the assessment of one knee. And so 
the portion that would go to Imovi would be $75 US. Um, moving forward, uh, as, as you'll see in the next slide, basically, uh, in terms of coding and billing, we do, um, any KG assessments are uh, reimbursed by private insurers. Uh, we've experienced reimbursement uh, depending on obviously the uh, insurance scheme that the patient is on. Uh, we've experienced reimbursement uh, to varying degrees from full to a percentage of reimbursement in Canada and the UK and the US. Uh, in terms of uh, public reimbursement, we're currently working on a pilot study with the Quebec government uh, to obtain public reimbursement but via RAMQ in Quebec. Uh, we're also doing certain economic studies in other regions um, in the US and in Europe to obtain public reimbursement in those regions as well. So that's a work in progress. But as of now, uh, patients have been getting reimbursed on, uh, private, uh, on their private insurance. So moving forward, uh, we also do have uh, professionals that work within our team at Imovi that provide support in terms of market access and reimbursement uh, on, on the private side and that uh, provide support in co contacting and communicating with uh, private insurers uh, to support our partner clinics. In terms of the training process, and so our training process, uh, as I mentioned previously, is also uh, there. There's no charge. We train uh, technicians uh, at our partner clinics, whether they be physical therapists, uh, medical assistants, uh, kinesiologists, um, or nurses, even. So we train them, and uh, the training process is in the uh, is, is at no cost. We issue a certificate. And in the next slide, we briefly outline uh, that process. And so we start with uh, an implementation uh, checklist. We have an implementation team at Imovi that works very closely with the partner clinics or partner hospital departments, as the case may be. We go through the checklist of all the different items that are going to be covered during the implementation process. We schedule the meetings with the people that are going to be trained. And essentially, there's two uh, two different types of training that take place. There's clinical training uh, that takes place over a six hour period. And there's also a technical training, which is more of how to place uh, the equipment on the patient, which is a four hour training. Once these two uh, trainings are done, it's really a question of the individuals practicing and usually it takes practice on 10 to 15 knees uh, to be comfortable to place uh, the uh, harnesses and the equipment and calibrate the camera to the equipment uh, for, for the technician. Once the 10 to 15 knees are done, the technicians are, are, are comfortable with the exam. There's a test that takes place and uh, we certify uh, the participants that are then to become certified uh, in EKG assessment technicians. Uh, as well, there's also uh, in the uh, clinical training portion, there is uh, a part of the training that uh, also trains the technicians on how, or trains a designated technician on how to fulfill uh, the reports uh, based on the raw data that's generated by the NEKG. As part of the implementation process, we also have training for front desk staff. So basically to train the reception area on how to deal with incoming calls of patients with uh, varying knee ailments or knee issues. And we basically train the reception on how to better direct patients to having an EKG exam, explaining them the process and so on and so forth. As part of, once the implementation is done, we have a team, a marketing team, that uh, assists the clinics or the hospital departments to put in place a communication plan. So we provide marketing material and marketing support uh, to our partners so that this way they can create awareness. And as we've experienced uh, with uh, our existing partners and existing clinics, uh, a lot of the assessments that are done, the EKG assessments that are done, are done on new patients. So there's definitely a new stream of patients that come in to the clinics. Um, 
due to the fact that there's this new technology uh, that's in place. And on this slide, you basically see some of the marketing support that we provide. So we provide a monthly calendar whereby uh, we post on social media uh, certain marketing information and news and so on and so forth. We also provide to our partner clinics the actual material so that they can post as well on their website um, and, uh, and on social media as well. As you see, uh, we have uh, brand ambassadors. One of them, Laurent Duvernay Tardif, is a uh, NFL football player for the Kansas City Chiefs this year. His team won the Super Bowl, so he's one of our brand ambassadors and was a patient that actually had knee issues and uh, had an EKG exam that helped him in his rehabilitation. Uh, we also have uh, Bruni Surin, former Olympic gold medalist in track and field, uh, who uh, experienced a knee OA and uh, had an EKG exam, which helped him in his recovery and his uh, treatment of uh, his knee OA. So basically, um, if there are any type of questions that you may have, you could always contact us at info at mov.ca. It would be our pleasure uh, to answer any questions with respect to the business model. And I know that you know the business model varies depending on which area of the world you're in. So it's uh, as with an EKG, it's not a one size fits all solution. We you know we personalize uh, our approach depending on where we are in the world. So I'd like to thank you very much, all of you, for the, taking the time uh, to join us this afternoon. And uh, if there's any questions, feel free to ask uh, in the chat box or contact us at Amovi at info at amovi.ca, and it'll be our pleasure to answer you. And uh, once again, thanks, uh, Joe and uh, Philip, for putting together another great webinar. Well, thank you very much, Mike, for walking us through the business model. I say it, was, it would have been difficult for uh, for me and Joe to, to do that. <laughs> It would have been very difficult for me to walk them through the clinical aspects. <laughs> I thank you as well. <laughs> I want to thank you also, uh, Joseni, for your time. Uh, Dr. Joseni, PT, PhD at uh, Rutgers University, professor of biomechanics, also a professor of physical therapy in the in USA. So thank you very much for your time and for your expertise and, and this lecture. No problem. Happy, happy to do it and happy to, to help out.